Good morning, everybody. I hope you are doing well. Um, I know a lot of people are sick right now, so hopefully you guys are all feeling healthy. Um, I'm actually trying to decide if I'm coming down with a cold or perhaps it's allergies. It might be allergies, but I'm feeling a little like stuffy. Um, but anyway, good morning. I'm happy to be here with you guys um, this morning. So today is our final um top like the final day that we're doing on um our book that we've been reading the um, emotional lives of teenagers so we'll finish discussing it today um hopefully you guys have been reading along you've enjoyed this book i have actually really enjoyed this book um i think that um i think it's really sound and just really uh, has some good advice um so i'm i I'm going to recommend this book to other people that are looking for like a good book on parenting teenagers that's not um super dense and super um I, I just I felt like this was like an easy read. Um and I, I don't know what you guys think, but I, I I recommend it. Um so why don't we dive in? I'm gonna put the first question that I want to um talk about in the chat. Um, so, um, starting with chapter four, um, and my, just so you guys know, Ms. Gunter, Ms. Yvonne and Ms. Cruz, um, Amy Cruz, um, they are at a district social workers meeting this morning. Um, so I'm flying solo today. So hopefully you guys as parents, you know, either put comments in the chat, if you want to like take yourself off mute and, um, join in and speak, I highly encourage it. Um, I'm going to need you guys to, so that way I'm just not talking to myself um, <laughs> this whole time. Um, but what is your initial reaction to the framework presented um, at the start of chapter four? That emotional regulation involves two complementary processes, finding ways to express feelings, and then when needed, finding ways to bring them under control. Um and I think for my part, I thought that that um, makes a lot of sense that, yes, we want our teenagers to be able to express their feelings, but also we need them to recognize that there are certain times where you have to kind of like bring your feelings under control um, and not let them just run everything, um, you know, and just like run amok. And um, like they have the example of the girl um, who had found out, I think she found out she didn't get a part in the school play, um, which was very upsetting to her. Um, but, you know, and she talks about, well, then I had to pull it together um, and go take a quiz. And, you know, then I had to like go and I had to go to another class and I had to, you know, I went to the bathroom and I cried and then I like had to like pull it together again. And, you know, the author was talking about how that was actually perfect. The, the teen, like, handled that perfectly. Yes, she was upset. Like, not getting something that you really, really wanted is upsetting. I think we all have experienced that in our lives, that, like, there was something we really wanted. We didn't get it. It's upsetting. You're allowed to feel sad about that. Like, that's a total normal reaction. But what's not you know, so far normal is like having your sadness and reaction, like get in the way of life. And so like, yeah, you can still be sad, but you got to pull it together. You know, as adults, we have to go to this meeting, we have to do this, you know, thing that we have to do. Um, and teaching our teenagers that yes, you feel sad, or you feel angry or whatever emotions you're feeling, but then you pull it together. Um, and you still are able to go about your life. Um, and I just, I'm curious if like you have found with your teenagers, like teaching them to do this. I know with my son, um, you know, we've had like my mother, you know, so his grandmother died in September. Um, he obviously, you know, had a hard time with that. We've had um, like three pets die in this past year, which has been very difficult for him. And so there's been days, like a couple of days where he's told me, like, I just need to, like, there was like one day in particular, he's like, I just need a day to stay home and like decompress. And I'm like, 
okay, I can give you this day and I understand and I'm glad that you're talking to me about this, but then you need to go to school. Like you need to, like, we can have one day, but then we need to like get it together and go to school and um, carry on that we can't just keep like, like being sad and not living our life um, because you still have a life and you still have responsibilities and things that you have to get done. Um, so I don't know, like if you guys have anything, um, where teaching your child, yes, feel your feelings, but also like you have to control your feelings and be able to like still, um, do life. Rupert, do you have any, have you dealt with that? Um, I always tell my children they're allowed to speak their truth and I, um, and but there's always an opposite like I'm allowed to respond to it agree to it disagree but I'm gonna allow you and I'm not gonna say anything I'm gonna give them that space to say exactly what they want to say even if it's like f you dad I've, I've said you can say it as long as you say it in the proper context if you say it maliciously then I'm upset but if it's just like hey back off go ahead speak how you want it how you know is your truth um Sometimes it backfires because sometimes I'm wrong and they prove me wrong and I get upset and then I get defensive. Um, but most of the time, your kids are kind of extensions of you. So a lot of the times I see myself or I see some of the negative ways that I can be and it's kind of the ways that they're learning from me. Um, so I kind of try to, you know, it's a, it's a it's always a learning opportunity for adults as well as the child. Um, and I feel like that dialogue helps when you actually sit back and let them actually tell you off to your face if that's what they want to do. Um, as far as the second half, my family has dealt with a lot of um, uh, deaths um, over the years. And I'm the, my wife calls me the Tin Man. I don't really show emotions when it comes to um, being like generally sad in some ways. Um, and I don't want my, I don't know if that's something that I developed or something that's just part of my personality. Um, but I do allow my kids to cry. I do like not even allow them to, I kind of like expect them to push them to like, go ahead. It's a natural emotion that I tend not to, I don't know. I don't know what's like if it's something that's wrong with me, but it's 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 hard. It's hard, and um, I don't. And I, and I think it's probably partially how I was raised or that generation yeah. of that like Latino macho ness, whatever. We're not supposed to sure. show or do certain things. Well, we'll try um, to avoid psychoanalyzing you today. <laughs> yeah, but I I I, I also um. um I don't say like, okay, now it's time to move on. I, I feel, cause my, my wife's family are one of the ones where they do it yearly. They celebrate birthdays. They celebrate, oh, this was uh, someone's favorite restaurant. Let's go here and have dinner. They like to keep stuff going. And then like, I'm kind of more of like the rest in peace. They're no longer with us. Like, let's move on. Um, mm -hmm. But seeing my wife's side do that, it's more, um, it's more therapeutic when you actually um, allow yourself to let them live through your mem through the memories you had together, um, so I like I like my kids to vent grief, any any kind of emotion how they choose to, other than me just dictating to them. Yeah, I think this is um, a good example of teaching your child to. Um like how to be an adult really, because as adults, like we have our emotions, but then we have to like control them. Like you have to like go on, you have to like have your job, you have to work with people you don't like, you have to, you know, I mean, just everything that we have to deal with as an adult, it's like we don't as adults tend to let our emotions control everything. If we are, then I mean, I'd hate to be judgy, but like I would venture to guess you're probably not all that successful at adulting. Um, but I think that it's important to recognize like, you know, the girl in 
book where Jada was her name, where she's like having this bad thing happen to her and going on with her day and, you know, breaking down the bathroom and then going back to class and like, you know, doing everything you're supposed to be doing, but like recognizing as a, for a teenager or for anybody, honestly, how exhausting that would be as a parent and like congratulating, like, you know, if your child has a day like that, where they had something like really like they got cut from a sports team, from the drama program. They got into a fight with their best friend. Um, they had a teacher make a comment to them that, you know, they took as like, maybe not offensive, but it like hurt them. You know, something like something bad happened to them at that, that day. And, but then they like bottled it up. They like went on, you know, and they like continued on with their day but they acknowledge their emotions and they're talking to you about it. Like, just like, I think at home later that night, congratulating them on like getting through that and doing what they were supposed to be doing, but then also acknowledging that it's exhausting. Like they probably do need more sleep. They do need like some, you know, self-care type, you know, and doing something that's going to, and they talk about that. I think I actually can't remember if it was this chapter or the next chapter. Oh, it's the next chapter where they talks about the comforts, um, you know, and like knowing your teen and like things that like make them feel comfortable um, and like encouraging them to do that and doing some self-care and like, hey, take care of yourself right now. Like that was really hard. Good, good job. Um, but let's, um, you know, I mean, I think it's important to... Um, and I think it's important to model that, you know, that for us doing um, for the same, you know, I had recently, um, you know, my mom died five months ago, but like, just, I think I talked about this last time. I can't remember. I um, can't remember if I talked about it with you guys or just with other people, but when the 49ers lost the Super Bowl, like that actually brought up, strangely enough, it totally shocked me, but it brought up a lot of emotion about my mom dying. Um, and I had a really bad day. I actually took a half day off of work. Um, I came into work that Monday morning and then I left um, because I was not in a good place. And I had to like go home. I had to like lay in bed and feel sad and just give myself that time. But that was actually actually something I talked to my son about, about how I was feeling and how I like coped with it. And I said, you know, I can't went into work um, this morning because I had some meetings that I couldn't miss. And so I had to deal with that. Like that was like, I had to pull myself together and like deal with life. But then I like, when I could, I let myself feel, feel sad and I needed that time to feel sad. And I, so I think that that's really important to model for our teenagers, like how we deal with our own emotions um, because we all have emotions. Bad things happen to us. Happy things happen to us, but we have emotions and how do we um, deal with that? Let's um, move on and talk about this next question. This is actually, this is, this is like five questions in one. Um, so under what conditions is your teen most likely to open up? If they tend to not talk about their feelings, why do you think that that's the case? Does your teen need time to reflect on emotions be before talking about them? Or are they wary of being put on the spot? Might a past interaction with you have left your teen feeling cautious about sharing closely held thoughts and feelings? So that's a lot to unpack there. Um, but think about when your teen, do they ever tell you about how they're feeling about something? And if they're not, is that just part? part of their personality. She uses the phrase, um, like sphinx like teens, which I just loved. Cause that like, that like, so described my son, who's just kind of this like silent, he does not talk a lot. I think there's a lot going on in there, but like, he is not somebody who is going to express a lot of emotion and like talk about his feelings a lot. Um, so when he does, you know, and she, I loved, she talked about like my advice that I always like to give, like have conversations in the car. My, that's when my son will likely open up. He like, when we're in the car, he will bring up some, um, stuff that he's been thinking about questions. He has just things that have been bothering him. Um, he is definitely the type that needs to reflect, um, he's not going to be somebody that's like, 
immediately like aware or immediately ready to verbalize what's going on. Um, so, you know, like the example I gave a couple minutes ago where I told him that I was really sad about my mom and what I needed to do, you know, that was something that he actually never later on talked to me about, but he did talk to my husband about it. Um, and so like he needed to take some time and reflect about it and think about it. And then he did talk to my husband about it. Um, so that, you know, is something that could happen that maybe they're not talking to you, but they talk to your partner or, you know, another relative, an older sibling. Um, I think it's important for teens to have somebody in their life that they can talk to. And maybe it's a couple of people. Um, this last question on here might past interaction with you have left your teen feeling cautious about sharing closely held thoughts and feelings. Um, and this is something that I think as parents, we need to do some uncomfortable self-reflection sometimes. Um, I think, I think it was the months, um, you know, where they talk, um, about, Oh yeah, there was an example, um, an antidote that she had in here where one parent had overshared um, and the teen got very upset because they felt like the parent was like, um, I think it was a relative had told, you know, like, oh, she likes this boy and da da da. And like the teen got very offended. And I made that mistake with my daughter um, where this was during the pandemic. Um, and if you guys remember like back in like, you know, that summer 2020 when nobody was leaving their house and you had, I don't know about you guys, but I had like Zoom socials with my friends that we normally hang out with. And so we were on, we were on a Zoom with all of our friends and we were just talking and I was telling them about how Hannah had been texting this boy and blah, 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 blah. And so she was upstairs and she heard me um, talking about this and laughing about it. And she got so upset and so offended. And I just felt so bad and I had to apologize, but like, I think we need to like, you know, sometimes as parents, we think it's okay to share something and they're not going to be okay. Um, stuff that I share with you guys about my kids, I do like, try to run it by them. Like, Oh, are you okay? If I talk about this, um, because I, you know, I think that that's important to do. Um, I know that, you know, when I reflect back with my own relationship with my mother, um, when I was a teenager, I felt like my mom was very judgy. Um, like she definitely judged my friends and, um, you know, would make some pretty snide comments about my friends. And that made me feel like I could never like really share with my mom the stuff that I was thinking about or what was going on with me. Um, so I, you know, that's something that I think we need to think about. Um, let's see. Leah says the book says on page 121, um, the more precise teenagers can be with articulating their feelings, the bigger benefit they'll get. Let them be and express their feelings. They will benefit from it, but guide them about boundaries between child and a parent. Respect should still be given in conversation. Absolutely. And I think that um, this is definitely something to like practice with your teen. Um, you may not be there yet, but like, and maybe start small, but like keep at it. Like, I think there could be some really big benefit from um, having this like interaction and like sharing and like having a safe space with your teen where they can talk to you and talk about their feelings. I mean, I, I, there's no downside to it other than you might learn some things that like, wow, um, you maybe wish you didn't know about your teen, but then in the long run, that's probably good. But I think if you've been like, you know, if you were like me, where you were gossiping with your friends and overshared about your teenager and your teenager got mad at you. I mean, the best thing to do is just apologize to own up to it. Um, and apologize, um, you know, like let them know that you're human. And as parents, sometimes we screw up, but, um, yeah, that's tough though. Um, any other comments about that before I move on to our next question? Yeah, I'll add on real quick. Okay. <clears throat> Cause I did this the other day. I actually was right, but I got over passionate 
That's what I call it now. I don't call it yelling. I get over passionate. But um, then I asked my son later, did you understand why I was upset? And he said, yes. When you explained it, I understood. I just stayed quiet because I didn't want you to yell at me anymore. And I said, okay, but I thought when you being quiet is that you didn't understand. So then we kept, we had the conversation where he understood, he stayed quiet. And then when I was um, less passionate about the subject, when I was able to talk about it uh, in, a, in a normal tone, uh, we actually, he understood what he did wrong. And then mm -hmm. I understood what I did wrong because the way I approached it. And I, I like this page 121 because respect should still be in the conversation and respect should be two ways, even though it's a child and a parent yeah. um, or period, even an adult and a child um, doesn't necessarily have to be your own for, for my sake. Um, so yeah, I just want to add to that. Yeah. I think that that, you know, the issue of respect and like in that relationship and respecting your teenager and them respecting you, I think that's so, so important. And it's really like these teenage years. And one of the things that makes it so difficult is like your relationship that you have with your teenager is really laying the foundation of the relationship you're going to have with your child when they're an adult. And I assume that all of us want to still be close to our children when they're adults. Um, and like a lot of that, you know, like right now is like laying the foundation of those conversations and like that relationship you're going to have with your child later. And I really be, you know, it's interesting with my, the six year difference between my two children where my son is now, you know, he's 14, he'll be 15 in a couple months. And my daughter is about to turn 21. So she's really like now in that adult phase. Um, but I think like, I have a good relationship with her now, but we, it was the work that we did as a teenager, like when she was a teenager to really like, I have that close relationship with her now. Um, all right. Let's this next question. This is another meaty question. Um, so this is we're actually moving on to chapter five now. Um, so teens often use distractions to manage their upset feelings. When in distress, does your teen tend to employ a preferred form of distraction? Are there times when your teen needs the use of distraction gets in the way of other things your teen needs to do? If so, how have you or might you talk to them about the upsides and downsides of distractions? So I think this is important. This is an important thing to know about your teen. Um, what do they use for distraction um, so that you can kind of like use that as a way to pick up on clues of what may be going on with them? Because, you know, they're not always forthright about what's happening. Um, you know, my son, you know, he loves his video games. He loves his YouTube, but he loves that always. Um, so, you know, he will definitely um, do, you know, um, use that. He also, I think when he's like really not feeling great and, you know, upset about something, um, that's when he like will ask to get um because he still likes to build Legos. And so that will be like he'll be like, oh, can I get a Lego set? Um, so that's something that he likes to like where it's just a I think a distraction. And um I'm trying to remember with my daughter. Um she had like TV shows that she would re-watch on Netflix um like over and over again. I want to say Gossip Girl is a big one that she will just constantly rewatch. So she has like that's what she does. Um I don't know you guys anything you want to share what does your child do for distractions? I me I my distraction is I like to read a book. Like if I have a good book that I like to read then I will just because it like allows me to just block out the rest of the world. Um so that's what I like to do. Rupert, what's your distraction? My own? Mm -hmm. I don't know, am I allowed to say it? I just usually just open a beer. <laughs> okay. 
There you go. Hopefully your teen isn't doing that. Uh, I don't know what um, the kids do. I, don't, I mean, they, they, they're usually just on their devices or they're on their devices. There's not yeah. really much else they do. I think it's, it's like it is. I feel like it's hard, harder now with their phones and social media um, that that may be their distraction. But it's also what they're kind of doing all the time. Leah says her daughter uses her love for music. She will play guitar um, and learn more. That's great. Um, I love a healthy outlet. That's awesome. Um, I think that, um, this is like teaching your teen and like, you know, like about self care and like, we'll talk about self care, um, more later on, but, um, and teaching them about in this kind of like, well, I'll just jump into the next question because it, um, on the same lines um but let's see Rochelle says my two teens are upset about something they just want to sleep my 21 year old son will go for a drive and really gets into his photography a walk or a Costco trip love it um so this kind of goes into like this next thing so like there's distraction and comforts so what comforts does your teen turn to when upset um and are there ways that you can support their use of preferred comfort such as um the parent who brought the beloved dog um when she picked up her son at the end of what she su suspected might be a very hard day so there was another anecdote in the book where um she suspected that her son was probably going to get cut from the basketball team um you know, and I think as a parent, we always kind of like, no, we want the best for our kid. But I think a lot of times we have a realistic like, well, she's not that great of an actress. So she's probably not going to get the lead part that she really wants it. Or like, yeah, he really loves basketball, but he's not. The other players are much better. I think a lot of times as parents, we have a kind of a realistic expectation of our kids. Um, and so you can anticipate when something bad is like they're when they're probably going to face some disappointment and so being ready um with comfort like when our um cat died this past spring and my son was like super upset about it because that was his cat I was like hey let's go to the lego store like that's that's something that you love it brings you comfort um like let's let's go over to the lego store um you know it may be that you make their favorite food um, um, it, you know, I think, and this is what I was, you know, getting to a couple minutes ago. I think it's important for us as parents to recognize and like, know, like, what are their preferred distractions? What are their preferred comforts and be prepared to, um, support them with that. But then also like, maybe like we can make suggestions sometimes, um, when my daughter, was really, um, and she was kind of in the thick of her depression. One thing that I would, um, and she's very susceptible to seasonal depression too. Um, and so being inside all the time is actually very bad for her. Um, she like needs some, some sunshine. And so I would, you know, talk her into like, Hey, let's go for a walk together. Um, and just get her outside and get, you know, some sunshine. Um, so just things like that where, you know, we can um, so make, you know, subtle suggestions and you don't want to be overbearing because then they're going to get mad at you. Um, but um, I think that that's, you know, an important way, you know, just like me where I like needed some self-care and needed a day to feel sad and like kind of like take care of myself, like what I needed. And I know this about myself, like I needed to lay in bed and read a book like that's that's what brings me comfort like that's what kind of like helps me reset um comfort food like ice cream for absolutely my um I was actually out of town when my daughter was a sophomore in high school and she broke up with her boyfriend and it was like he dumped her it was devastating it happened at school she was <laughs> like you know it was total that total like you know she had to pull it together to go to her English class and it was terrible um, but my husband went and like bought a couple gallons of ice cream and like just actually ate ice cream with her that evening. Um, and, you know, so things like that, you know, this is the type of stuff like this, man, T 
teenage, the teenage years are rough. They're going to, they're going to get dumped. Somebody's going to say something that they're not going to like, and they're going to get a fight with their best friend and it's going to be horrible. Um, and we just have to like, I think like the key for us as parents is not to try to fight those fights for them. You know, we don't want to like swoop in and yell at their best friend for them. Like that's not actually an appropriate thing for us as parents to do. Like they need to learn how to deal with these relationships. Um, but what we can do as parents is support them with distractions, with comfort, um, and, you know, teach them how to like, help themselves feel better you know and I kind of glossed over I want to go back um to the distraction question um are there times when your teen's use of distractions gets in the way of things your teen needs to do like you know they're on that cell phone they're on their social media they're playing games on their phone or watching things on their phone but they're not doing their homework um and so I think that that you know I think comfort. And so the upsides and downsides of distractions is, yeah, it's good to be distracted and like not think about it. But the downside with distractions is distractions can like really like um, lead into like they're not doing some of the stuff that they're supposed to be doing. So to me, the answer and what I like about this is kind of reframing when we talk about like social media and like their video games and all this stuff and how like the downside may be bringing in like you know, thinking about it in like a different frame that they are trying to distract themselves from something that's bothering them. And so maybe introducing them instead, to, uh, instead of distraction to something that's going to bring them some comfort. You know, maybe it's ice cream, maybe it's going on a walk, maybe it is going to Costco or Target. My son loves to go to Target. Like that is his like ultimate, like he's like, can we go to Target? It's his favorite. Um, it's hanging out with the pet, you know, and like um, the dog that they love, the cat that they love. Um, and so doing that um, and introducing that as a way um, hopefully can be helpful. Um, okay, let's, you guys have any more comments about that? Feel free, because I'm going to pull up our next, we only have two more questions. This one's a kind of a, heavier question though. Okay. Raising teenagers stirs up intense feelings in parents. <laughs> what aspects of raising a teen has been the most emotionally challenging for you? How well do you feel when you've been able to manage your own emotions throughout your child's adolescence? Has having a teen changed your perspective on events from your own teen years? If so, how? Um, yeah, so this is a heavy question. And like, just like, let's let's talk about it. Like, I think being a parent of a teenager, I've said this before, I think it's the hardest job in the world. Um, I personally actually enjoy this age more than other ages. Um, I think, you know, I'm, I was a high school teacher. I'm a high school principal. Like the teen years, like this is actually my career. Like I am like, like this is, I've made my career focused on teenagers. Um, I enjoy this age. I enjoy um, their discovery of the world. I enjoy them finding their humor. Um, I enjoy them finding their independence. Um, I've did not really enjoy the um, baby toddler years. Um, that wasn't, I, that's not a child, that's not an age that I really enjoyed. Um, so, but I acknowledge that I might be a little weird with this <laughs> um, and that other parents like maybe like, oh God, this, these, are, these are the worst years. Um, what I have been what I have found to be the most challenging as a parent, to be completely honest, is when they don't regulate their emotions well. Um, you know, I had a hard time when my daughter was super depressed. I, cause like, I mean, and like, I think like most parents, I was just like, why can't you get it together? Like, why can't you just why, why are you feeling all these emotions? And so I think it's 
you know, and I had to really like the guilt I felt about that. I really had to grapple with that. Um, I like, and I've shared this before. I don't know if I've shared it this year, but doing when my daughter, um, I think we talked about this when we talked about um, IOP intensive outpatient therapy programs. Um, but there was a component of that that was um, family therapy. And doing that, I found to be very, very helpful. Um, and so I'm to be completely honest, when I like design these topics and the stuff that we talk about on these Wednesday mornings, it's really kind of with that frame of mind and like talking to other parents about how it's difficult to be a parent of a teenager, I think is really helpful. Um, and so that's one way that I've been able to manage my emotions. I mean, you guys are helping me out. I have a team teenager at home. Um, this is like group therapy for me. Um, and like being able to talk about this stuff, I hope that you feel the same way because I do find that that is very helpful and that it's not, um, so lonely, um, with, you know, cause parenting oftentimes is a, is a lonely job. Um, and having it, how, like the last question on here, having a teen, how has that changed my perspective of my own teen years it definitely has um not gonna lie it's made me feel more critical of my parents um because I look at the way they parented me as a teenager um and just yeah I like, and I just like, there's things that's like, yeah, I, they shouldn't have, like, I wish they had handled this this way. Um, and so, um, <laughs> yesterday, my daughter, um, is actually, she's writing a paper for some class of hers. And so she texted me yesterday and she was like, and she called my mom, Mimi, um, didn't call her grandma. Her, my mom's name was to my kids, Mimi. Um, and so she, so my daughter texts me and she's like, Hey, what was your relationship like with Mimi as you were growing up? And I was like, text her back. I'm like, wow, Hannah, that's a really heavy question for 2 PM on a Tuesday when I'm at work. And like, I don't know if I really want to delve into that. Um, but yeah, I'm going to be honest, like being the parent of a teenager has made me be a little bit more, um, critical of my parents, um, and the way that they dealt with things. Um, I don't know. Anybody want to share thoughts about parenting teenagers and like the emotional roller coaster that you've been through and what it's made you think about? I'm ahead of my kids where I have to feel like I'm, I have to dial back. And then I work at a high school for the past 10 years I've been at a high school. So I, see some of the kids that I, I we like to call them the extra love kids that you start to see if your kid's going to go in that crowd because he kind of dresses like you know he's in that crowd but not necessarily then you start to see where he's at you know i was talking to him and his friend the other day about vaping on, on uh he goes to silver creek i was like and they were they were oblivious to how extreme it is and i liked that they said, oh, yeah, we know that there's kids that do this. We don't know what they're called. We don't know where they get them. And it's, like, really good, right? Because, like, here, I some of the kids are like, oh, they all sell them here or whatever here. They'll, they'll tell me. But so then I have to dial back to see where my kid is at based on – I have to try to not go with the kids that I work with every day because I see them more than I see my actual kid. Mm -hmm. So then you're kind of – not comparing them, but you're kind of seeing where your own kids are at. And I don't want to give away too much or introduce them to something that they're not really ready for because I'm already prepared for it. And I don't want to be the trigger that like inspires them to look for it. Right. If that makes sense. Like yeah. I don't want to have the vape discussion and then they're like, Oh, so there's vaping everywhere. It is more common than we thought. And maybe like, you know, they try to vape, you know, so Rupert, I, I really try to hold back I, on that. I do truly hope that you and I are like still like around each other and having these conversations when like your second set of kids becomes, cause you like me, like <laughs> you have a bigger age gap between your kids, but like 
it's been interesting that, you know, with the six year age gap, I felt like with my daughter, she went through all of her teen years. So I went through like the whole like phase of teenage development with my daughter before my son mm-hmm. became a teenager. And so it's been interesting this like second time around um, with like knowing like I made this mistake with Hannah. I'm not going to make this mistake with Nathan, um, you know, and like kind of like things that I choose and like the battles I choose to fight and like what I let go of. I've kind of like I've got some wisdom now where I've done this before. Um, and so those of you that um, are parenting teenagers where it's not your first teenager. I'm wondering if you've like have felt the same where you've kind of learned, um, you know, every child of course is different, but I feel like you kind of learn what you're doing. Um, let's see. I've got some comments in the chat. Leah says, my daughter and I have a 42 year age gap. I'm 58. She's 15. And it's hard to compare my generation to hers, but what helps is to learn everything that this generation is about and understand this is a kind of generation we have now you know and i think that's a really good point especially you know i don't have that i was 30 when my daughter was born um but even that like things have so rapidly changed in our society with you know the internet and um cell phones and um i feel like like even if you think about the way you were as a teenager, you know, even if you don't have that big of an age gap, it's still so crazy different. And like the stuff that we, our teens face with and our deal, um, deal with, I don't think any of us had to, uh, face that, um, and have the same challenges. And so recognizing that I think is really important, um, as a parent, um, Amy says the coffee talk is very helpful. I often use it as a chance to talk to my kids about certain topics. Um, I've learned something and felt better after reading this book. Thank you. Well, thank you. That makes me very happy. Um, so that's the intention behind it. So when I hear that it's working, that's good. And even if it's just like a couple of people, um, to me, that's totally worth it. Um, cause I, th- I, you know, and when I started doing this, when I, um, started as principal my daughter had just I think my daughter when I started here um, she was a sophomore in high school um so I was just kind of in the thick of it too and really like looking at like you know one of the things they recommend when you become a principal is like make sure you reach out to the parents and you have like opportunities to talk to parents and so I was really looking at it like well as a parent of a kid in high school what what do I wish my child's high school was offering me and like, you know, um, and so that, and that actually has been a really great frame of mind and like, um, perspective, um, because I'm in your shoes. I understand. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, and Amy, I'm really glad that you also enjoyed the book. So let's, that actually brings me to the last question I wanted to talk about today. Um, oh, I'm glad you guys find this helpful. I, I, it really, this is an important, to me, this is a very important part of my job and I really, I put a lot of thought into it. And so I, that makes me very happy. Um, so how has reading this book, The Emotional Lives of Teenagers changed how you regard and respond to your teens emotions? Um, so like Mm -hmm. Amy said, she found this very helpful. One thing that I think really like stuck to me, you know, and I've read a lot of books about parenting teens and like, you know, I mean, like I said, like, this is actually something I do for a living. So, um, I don't know if I really learned all that. I mean, I, I think like this book for me, like it like helps sharpen, um, you know, some of the like ideas I had, but one thing that really struck with me that I don't know if I would have really like thought about all that much before was, and she talks about it several times that mental health is not about feeling good. And I think that that's something that in society now, like, you know, we talk about wellness and we talk about self-care that it's all kind of in this frame of mind of like making yourself feel good and always feeling good and good mental health means that you have emotions and that you aren't always happy 
And I think that that's really important to acknowledge and to think about um, and to realize like in ourselves, like if we are like self-critical about, you know, oh, I'm feeling angry or I'm feeling sad um, and that I'm not feeling happy right now, that that's totally normal and we shouldn't be so critical of ourselves. But then to teach that to our teenagers because they're not going to be happy all the time. Like that's actually not normal. Um, it reminds me of that movie, um, the movie Inside Out. You guys seen that movie? Well, like she's got all the emotions, like it talks about like living inside her head. And like, there's the one that was like, I think it was Joy, um, was like any you of know, the idea that she should always be happy, but then actually know to be a balanced person and to be a balanced adult you have to have all the emotions. Like every single emotion is super important for us to all have. And that what's really important is to learn how to balance those emotions and regulate them um, and live with them so that they don't control your life. Um, so that was like the major thing that I took away from this book um, that I felt to be very helpful. I would love to hear from you guys um, anything that you discovered and found helpful um it's funny that you use the word sharpen your tools i think it softened mine <laughs> the discussions that we have um because usually i'm like a certain way with the students that we work with because i have to be i can't yell at the kids that we work with because they're not mine so i kind of when i go home i'm more aggressive or passionate as i try to use now with my own kids but i think having these discussions based on this book, it really, um, I, I stop more, I listen more, I um, want to hear what they're going to say because I want to, I want to like analyze it because now that I know you have tools, now you want to implement them. So it's kind of like you can't do that when you're being over aggressive or over passionate or talking over the your child. And I think some of this, it, it gives you the tools to not only um, listen more, but what to listen for mm -hmm. and how to, you know, approach that. And I think for me that, that especially being a male, um, raising males, and even though I, I am, I was raised from a single mother, I just still have that macho-ness that I try to lessen, soften. Um, and I think that really helps me. This discussion, like, um, as a parent and being kind of the only male I have to regulate how, and I'm talking about the only male in this and usually in the coffee talks, I don't know how many of us there are in here, but, um, usually I feel like I'm the only one. Um, and I think it helps me. It really does. And then I can use it in life. I can use it in my personal, professional, every kind of thing. And I, and I think it's, it's, um, yeah, it helps me. It helps me like just back away from myself sometimes. Good, good. Um, so Leah says, yes, it helps us understanding deeper what's going on with our teenagers, especially their emotions that sometimes we neglect to recognize. And after reading this book, we know how to handle it. And I love that you say like, we neglect to recognize it. I totally like, you know, it's so easy. Like we get busy, you know, you're tired coming home from work, you're tired from your day. And it's easy to like not notice that there might be something going on, especially if you've got this, like what they talk about, the sphinx-like kid that's just going to be quietly dealing with it and not, you know, expressing a lot of emotions. They're not the kid that's slamming doors and like yelling. And um, sometimes, you know, it's hard. Those are the ones that it's harder to pick up on what's going on. Um, but I, I like what I think I like to, you know, all of the examples that she used um, in this book, because I could definitely see patterns like in like things that like oh, that sounds like my kid, or something like working at a high school. Rupert, I'm sure you had the same like oh I since I know a kid at the school that's just like that. Um, so yeah, really um, normal stuff. So hopefully you guys enjoyed this book. I I really did. Um, I don't know if you um, saw the recommended resources um which was in the back of the book um they had you know some good um i did want to point it out because the first one where it's adolescent development in the um 
book by Jay Duffy, Parenting the New Teen in the Age of Anxiety. That is a good book. That was actually the book club book that we did two years ago. Um, so I do recommend that book. So um, two years ago, when we did the same thing where we read books as par with a parent group, that was the book we read. So that is a good book. So I do recommend that. And also in the same one, they have um, listed um, by DJ Siegel, Brainstorm the Power and Purpose of the Teenage Brain. Somebody had recommended that book to to me, I bought it. I have not read it. I'm about to knock everything over on my desk, um, but I have it right here. And so I was like, oh, I need to actually read that book because it's been sitting in my to read pile. So um, that's something. So if you found this topic interesting and wanted to read more, like I did think that there was actually a list of like 30 books um, that, you know, is recommended. So, um, if you wanted to do more, um, that's there for you. Okay. So our topic for next week, we are talking about, um, next week is the 6th of March. We are in March next week. Um, and so we are going to be talking about sexuality and gender. Um, so this is, um, an important topic. Um, and, We'll be talking about, you know, like how to handle it if your teen is exploring their sexuality um, and you might be surprised by some stuff that they are exploring um, with their sexuality and gender. Um, you might have like always suspected. Um, I will definitely share um, with you like what I dealt with as a parent in this topic. Um so that's a good topic. Um, and hopefully you guys will join us next week. Um, enjoy this beautiful day. We're going to have beautiful weather today. Um, we've got rain coming tomorrow. So enjoy today because um, I think we're going to have a couple of days of no sun. So get out there, take a walk, enjoy the sun while we have it. Um, thank you guys. Um, have a really great week. All right. Thank you.